here I was, newly freelance, full-time freelancer. The contest came up and I submitted seven different ideas. And Eberron was the final idea I submitted. And part of it was just, I thought it was fun. I didn't think they'd actually go for it. I was just like, ooh, I'd like to do that. And part of that was for the previous three years, I had been working as lead designer on a pulp-themed MMORPG. It's next to impossible to talk about Dungeons & Dragons and not mention the setting of Eberron. Wizards of the Coast put a call out for a new setting for Dungeons & Dragons. Keith Baker was one of thousands who submitted their ideas, and they picked his. Eberron takes the world of fantasy and says, what if magic was a science? It's a mixture of pulp and noir and standard fantasy, and it's extremely popular among players of Dungeons & Dragons. I sit down with Keith Baker and we learn where the idea of Eberron came from and how did he develop it over time. Eberron has been used in three different editions of Dungeons & Dragons. We talk about his approach and his thinking, what he hoped the goals of Eberron would be and how they were accomplished. We break down his newest game called Adventure Zone Bureau of Balance. And wow, it can be a great introduction to the role-playing genre. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Keith Baker, the creator of Eberron. Enjoy. Playing a tabletop strategy game allows you to unplug and test your skills against friends. Every week, Third Floor Wars delivers useful strategies, discussions, battle reports, and reviews to tabletop games like Malifaux. If you want to get better at the games you already play or discover the games other people are playing, you are in the right place. Craig and Ray welcome you to the third floor and the Tabletop Talk broadcast. Craig here on the third floor. Today's guest is Keith Baker of Together Studios. Keith is best known for creating the Dungeons and Dragons setting of Eberron. Eberron may very well be the most popular and talked about setting for Dungeons and Dragons. Now, as my listeners know, um, I took a 20, 25 year break from role playing and uh, found it again about a year and a half ago. And so when I left role playing, um, there was basically Redbox, right? Um, I think there was just talk of a third edition coming out. And when I came back, uh, there was a couple things that immediately I recognized and Eberron was one of them. It was everywhere. Um, so I've been so Super excited uh, to have Keith on. Now, Eberron, for those that may not be familiar, combines a fantasy tone with pulp and a dark adventure elements and some non-traditional fantasy technology such as trains, skyships, and mechanical beings, which are all powered by magic. Um, so everybody that um, I've been talking to now that I've gotten back into role-playing games talks about it. So Keith, welcome back to the third, or welcome to the third floor. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Um, so what I'd like to do first, Keith, is, um, and this might be tough to do because it's been uh, so ingrained in your life for so long, but believe it or not, there was a day that Keith mm-hmm. didn't know that you could roll dice and pretend to be <laughs> other people. So I'd like to go back to that day and then what happened next. So when did you first kind of discover this entire idea of tabletop gaming? Uh, I was very young. Uh, it was with the white box and the first edition books, uh, the hardcover AD&D books. Yeah. Uh, and I was probably about seven. Wow. When I first got a hold of those, I had enjoyed Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And uh, my mom, I was, you know, a single mother, you know, basically was just looking for things to to keep me busy and entertained and was like, these seem sort of like Lord of the Rings. Uh, So handing me those, I would say I probably didn't play D&D till I was about probably 11. Right. Uh, You know, more like fifth, you know, fifth or sixth. I think fifth grade was when I ran my first adventure. But I read the books and loved the books, like just the monster manual. Back in that day, that was like a magical book, you know, this big compendium of monsters. Uh, And as someone who liked mythology and folklore, I had this deities and demigods, which could actually basically (laughs) tell me, like, if Thor and Zeus got into a fight, who would win? Right, right. Uh, So so like I say, it took a little while before 
I actually started running. Once I did, uh, I was, you know, I was basically the DM about 90% of the time. I was just like, oh, all my friends, you got to do this. <laughs> I did start a D&D club at my school. Uh, so, yeah. And, and, you know, as other things came out, I got into, um, you know, Call of Cthulhu. Sure. Uh, even I remember Steve Jackson's original version of uh, Fantasy Trip. Nice. You know, they came out with a with a recent version. So yeah, I remember all those things. So let's go back more towards the beginning. So so your your mom drops this into your lap and says, mm -hmm. "Please stop bothering me. Go read." Yep, right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you start digesting this. And mm -hmm. um, I've talked about it with a lot of people on the podcast before. Um, and I don't know. I th I think I'm older than you, but not by much. I uh, but possibly. But um. You know, people don't realize or a lot of people don't realize the challenge we had learning role playing games because we didn't have message boards. We didn't have the Internet. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have actual play. And it, it was, you know, when you're first exposed to it, it's it's nothing like anything you've read before. Right. Or done before. So what was that process like from you from when those books were dropped in your lap to the first time you ran a game? Uh, and that was, See, you know, I almost argue that starting as young as I did actually was a benefit to that. Yeah, t tell me about because, that. Because let's face it, really to a certain degree, uh, you know, a couple years before that, I'd been running around the playground convincing other kids to play dinosaurs or, you know, uh, instead of cowboys and Indians, we played Greek and Egyptian gods. Sure. Uh, you know, so I was already and I think actually now I think about it when I was promoting mythological horseplay. Uh, in kindergarten, that was actually because of the the deities and demigods. Because I had stats, <laughs> like I knew that I knew that Toth was like totally cool because he could use right. any spell from the whatever. Uh, so what I'm saying is, even before we actually started rolling dice and sitting around a table, I was already essentially convincing kids to play Dungeons and Dragons just on the playground. Interesting. And so what I'm saying is that transition. We all start out as children making up stories. And essentially, you get this transitioning point as we move into adulthood where, oh, it's not really you shouldn't just be making stuff up <laughs> and pretending you're someone else. Right. Uh, and I'm saying I kind of just jumped across that gap without uh, a lot of awkward in between time. Sure. So did you find I mean. And again, this is going back a long time, Keith. Sure. Did you did you find uh, there was a lot of fumbling with the rules and things like that? Or did you guys really not care much about the rules at the beginning? Well, and that's exactly what I'm saying is, is I got the books when I was much younger and it was, you know, four or five years before I was actually like, OK, right. now we're going to actually <laughs> do this. Uh, I will say I remember very distinctly, though, you know, a couple things. First. Definitely, I sort of got all of it. So I suspect the first thing we probably actually played played was basic D&D. &D. Right. And basic D&D &D was pretty basic. Yep. So, you know, you have that as a starting point. Uh, and also, I very clearly remember the original example in the DM's guide, the first Dungeon Master's guide, where it had a little like walking through of here's this group going through the uh, the dungeon and rolling these dice, doing each thing like it was a two page, you know, really step by step. This is what this looks like. And I got to say, I feel like that that pretty much showed me this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I'm quite sure we weren't doing the rules properly. Right. But you we don't know, even do that now while, as adults. But yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. Who cares? So now you think, let's talk about what was kind of next for you, right? So you, you did that in, you know, fifth and sixth grade. And if you look back on it, what was kind of the next step for you as far as digesting this type of, uh, of material? Was there a game that um, was significant, like a next game for you? Not that you left D&D. But one that maybe changed the way you thought about things? So it's funny, actually, now you mention that. Uh, you know, I tried lots of different things, and, and that was part of what I enjoyed. So I know I played all the Chaosium games, like Call of Cthulhu, Stormbringer. Uh, I tried probably the Palladium ones. I forget the order. But f curiously enough, I would say, actually, that the game that sort of was my next big like long-term campaign and that I distinctly remember, you know, sort of my junior high, early high school games in uh, was a tiny fringe game that I'd be amazed if you've even heard of called Element Masters. Oh, 
And basically, I used to go to a convention called EveCon every year. Uh, and the people who made this game, it was in Virginia, and the people who made this game, were, you know, came to this convention and released it. And, you know, I have a copy of this, and for all I know, it's one of like a thousand copies in existence. And it just had a number... It had a little built-in story that I liked. All your characters, you know, it's a sort of D&D thing, but you're trying to master this. You know, you're all sort of chosen people with the power to control the elements if you can master it and protect your, uh, you know, world from mysterious invading forces. And I think what I liked about it is it was somewhat concrete. You had the sort of Dragon Lance like uh, right. you know, threat, and yet very vague at the same time. So leaving a lot of room for me to basically anything could come through this this portal and threaten you. So compared to Dragon Lance, which I also read in, in high school, there was a lot more room for me to make this world my own. And uh, the character creation system wasn't a class-based system. It was, you know, a skill-driven thing. So it was more flexible. Right. Uh, I remember combat had hit locations, for example. So there was like a little more... A little GURPS-ish. Yeah, a little more specificity. And this is definitely before GURPS. Sure. Uh, because I will say the next step... So that was Element Masters, and as I said, that just, I think, was the thing that broke me off D&D, <laughs> if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, I will say the thing that then was the big game for me for probably six years going forward that I ended up doing most of my sort of late high school once I really sort of was more in control of what I was doing and what I played mostly in college uh, was the hero system. Oh, nice. uh, the early edition champions. And then when they first came out with fantasy hero, which was yeah. their version of the hero system. And what I loved about the hero system, again, this was before GURPS, is that it was, uh, again, not class based, not race based. You know, this was all point driven. You created, uh, you know, you created your character from scratch and you could sort of pursue any concept. Right. And um, and even for things like magic and stuff, you know, to a certain degree, you basically as the, the game master kind of had to build the magic system. You know, they had a basic for it, but yep. you had to go from there. And I think for me, it was really just that flexibility, that that sort of ability to come up with any sort of concept. Uh, and even I'll go ahead and say, because, again, it was it was building off of champions. Um, one of the things that was interesting that has probably stuck with me more than I would have thought about until we started talking about it now is the fact that when you made fantasy hero characters, you had to have disadvantages. <laughs> that you got disadvantages to get the points for your yep. good things. And so if you're playing a fantasy hero character, you're probably hunted by a criminal organization and you have some kind of horrible disfiguring something and you have a psychological thing. And, you know... All of that, in a way, encouraged you to build sort of deeper characters than I'm just a dwarf fighter. And and I think that's always stuck with me of, of to me, characters having flaws yep. is part of what makes them interesting. And that plays into Eberron's sort of noir aspect. So we're, we're at this point now, we're late high school, early college, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. everything that we've talked about so far, Keith, has been fantasy-ish, right? And, and was that really just your preferred setting? Is some form of that or? No, not at all. Actually, again, when I started with the hero system, it was champions. It was, okay. Uh, so I was excited when they came out with Fantasy Hero and I convert, you know, jumped onto that. But I played champions, which is superheroes. And I'll, I'll say I started with villains and vigilantes in nice. the superhero world. Uh, and I probably played the Palladium superhero game. I forget what it was called. Super World or something like yeah. that. Uh, so I, I tried all kinds of things. I played Psy World when it came out. Gamma World, of course. Yeah. Um, I loved Expedition to Barrier Peaks. I'll just note is I mostly bought uh, modules, but didn't actually run them. I just was interested in reading the, I, you know, sort of ransacking through ideas. Sure. One of the only adventures I actually ran straight from the book was Expedition for the Barrier Peaks, just because wow. it was, you know, intriguing. Um, I'll say that one of my favorite high school campaigns that I ran was actually something where it was ostensibly to the players. It was a sort of cyber 
a cyberpunk superhero game uh where it's a sort of judge dready sometime in the future you're playing the the superpowered protectors of a city and what i didn't tell the players is that this was also actually a cthulhu story <laughs> and that you know basically in the end of their they all make their superhero -y, cyber -y characters and at the end of the first adventure like their whole city gets destroyed by essentially an old one rising uh and all sorts of crazy stuff sort of goes from there um this is one of the things that i'll say i love of you can't just do this with people you don't know it's not something they do but what i loved in that adventure is i knew the players would love a horror story right but i loved the fact that they did not know this was a horror story so they just thought they were going to be taking, uh, you know, throwing people in jail and making <laughs> monologues and, and not that like, oh, they would be facing things like one of the main threats we ended up dealing with um, was something analogous to the thing. So wow. a shape changing yep. telepathic thing. Uh, what they discovered is they basically only had five cities and they got to this one point where one of the cities was infected with this. And I one of my favorite moments in my role playing history is. Uh, the players are in essentially a little fighter craft type thing armed with nuclear missiles, essentially <laughs> arguing. Uh, one of the players is basically saying, we have no idea how many of these things there are, how much of the population has been infected. We have got to just nuke this city to to just end it here. Yeah. And the other player saying, you're insane. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. You can't do that. And uh, and finally, after they argue this for a while, the player just makes a dramatic button pushing motion with his hand. And I'm like, oh, there you go. And uh, the two things about it is that what I loved is in that moment, the players weren't thinking about their stats. They weren't thinking about their numbers. They were really in this moment of what do you do? Yep. You know, this is this no win situation. Uh, and then the other bad news was that they had one of the creatures with them on their shuttle. Oh. So they actually ended up taking it to the next city after the one guy did make this terrible decision. Isn't it, isn't it amazing, Keith, how, I mean, I don't know how many years ago that was, but that was a long time ago. Oh, yeah. And yeah, yeah. how fresh it is in your mind still, oh, yeah. those moments. And it's something that I try to explain to a lot of other gamers. Like, you know, I've played all kinds of different tabletop games, mm -hmm. miniature games, so on and so forth. But... What burns in my brain, what I can go back to high school, Craig, and remember is exactly the type of stuff you're just talking mm -hmm. about, which I think is truly unique to, to role playing. Well, I think what someone told me, uh, a trend of phrase they used in, uh, in 2009, I traveled around and was playing games with people all over the world. And a phrase one fellow used is he said that it was sort of like creating a personal mythology. Yep. That if you think of myths as stories that define a culture, in a sense, when we have a group of friends who play a role playing game for a year, you know, we are cre these are the stories that we share yeah. that define our little group. Yeah. And so that's the point with that group of friends. We've always got that story like that was a dramatic moment. We're always going to forget. And I've got, a, you know, easily a half dozen more of just moments from that period that I know anybody in whatever group it was will remember that particular uh, piece. And if you hadn't mm -hmm. seen them for decades and you happen to catch them at the bar and say, do you I remember? And I guarantee they will. Oh, and they that's, will. That's what's amazing about and, it. And uh, and so, yeah, so I'll say that I probably, you know, I, I fantasy still was probably the larger segment. Like once I did start playing fantasy hero, that was the bigger you know, the, the main thing I did. But again, I did do sci-fi. I sure. did do Cthulhu. Uh, and frankly, I've done a couple of other, you know, Cthulhu Flux, Cthulhu yeah. um, uh, Gloom. So, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm multi-genre. Well, right. I get, and, and I wasn't insinuating that you weren't. It was more, you know, a preference, right? And, and, sure, and sure. a gravitational pull, I guess, for, yep. for lack of a well, better word. And then the funny thing about it is actually the next step. Uh, is when I, the first thing I had published uh, was actually a piece uh, in an anthology for a role-playing game called Over the Edge, published by Atlas Games in the 90s. And that's very much a Twilight Zone, Illuminati, X-Files sort of uh, setting. 
And I actually wrote a, a bunch of stuff for Over the Edge. And so I would say that was the next. I ran a lot of Over the Edge campaigns uh, because I enjoyed the system. And so basically I would say if you step away from fantasy, uh, Over the Edge and that sort of modern conspiracy stuff is, is another genre I've certainly played around with a lot. Now, when you were playing with your childhood friends, and and, and I'm including you know young, mm -hmm. young college sure, in, sure. in there, were you running the games mostly or what did mostly. you guys wrote mostly were okay mostly. and and so you found yourself creating right you were creating mm -hmm. worlds for them you were you were cobbling together things you were reading in different modules and and you know and running them through these adventures talk to me about the transition when you finally said you know what i think i can do more than just run games when i like i think i want to work on this and talk about over the edge right like at some point you decided you know, shit, maybe somebody else wants to, to read the crap I'm coming up with. Oh, I decided that actually very early on. Yeah. Uh, I will say I decided that by probably the time I was 14. Wow. And the basic point to me was I I had these cool books that, you know, I'd had since I was nine. Like, here's this this deities and demigods. And the point to me is someone wrote this book. This is a job that someone can have. And I don't know how you get that job, <laughs> but it is a job. And so this is the funny thing compared to a lot of people I know who like didn't know what they want to do and do whatever. I knew what I wanted to do. Interesting. And of course, the main point is when I went to college, there was no concept of like a game design major or anything like that. So part of it, like I said, was well, I know how you got that job. But I always knew that was what I wanted to do and that there were people who did it. Right. So even in high school, I like... Uh, you know, not only was I, of course, uh, game mastering and creating adventures, but I even like made some board game uh, prototypes and things like that. Um, when I got out of college, part of the point was, OK, how do you get that job? Mm -hmm. um, I I didn't know. So I ended up working at a bookstore for a year. Um, I then stumbled into a job uh, with a computer game company. And it's a funny thing because this is all sort of coincidental and sideways, but I ended up working in computer games for a while. Uh, and the company I ended up working at, which I started off just as a production assistant getting coffee and worked my way up into the design department. Uh, but the people I worked with there included uh, Zeb Cook, who <laughs> made Planescape, yep. you know, Oriental Ventures, uh, Lawrence Schick, who did White Plume Mountain, um, and Ken Ralston, who made, say, Paranoia. Yeah, okay. such, a great, such a great game. Um, <laughs> and and so I sort of just stumbled into this job. Like, basically, I, I was a production assistant for Zeb Cook and ended up when he finally, I can't remember if it was when he quit that company or, or just changed products. You know, I ended up uh, basically taking over as designer on wow. a, the product, you know, project we've been working on. Uh, and... I actually ended up basically, as I said, rising from production assistant to designer to lead designer and working in the computer game industry for eight years. But it was never what I wanted to do. You yep. know, I'd always wanted to make uh, TTRPGs. And I can tell you, it's a very different experience, you know, even then. Um, so that was when, while I was doing that, I found the open call for submissions for Over the Edge, put some stuff in there, got some stuff out there. Then uh, then I just started doing freelance work for a lot of little companies at the time. Uh, I did a couple of books for Goodman Games when they were first, like literally had just started. Uh, I did some work for Steve Jackson and I think Pyramid. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a bunch of entries in various anthologies that uh, Green Ronin uh, did for Freeport. Um, and frankly, what happened is that I found the computer game industry very frustrating, yeah. even though it paid fine. Uh, and after eight years, I basically said... I am getting enough freelancing jobs that I'm just going to quit and see if I can do this full time. Yep. And that was 2002, 2003. I can't remember. Literally two months later, Wizards announced the fantasy setting search. <laughs> and not only was there Eberron, but the next year I made Gloom. My wow. card game. So yeah. that worked out OK for me. And now, in your mind, Keith, was the pressure you put on yourself of saying, you know, screw it, I'm going for this? Did that impact, do you think, your ability to 
to to make it happen? Or do you think it was going to happen either way? Oh, no, no. I mean, first off, it's not an easy field right. to, to get into. Uh, and and so, yeah, I think that was definitely uh, it was not going to happen if I didn't make it happen. Right. Uh, I will say that Eberron Wizards deciding to do the fantasy setting search at all was a huge stroke of luck. Sure. You could have predicted that was going to happen. Uh, and beyond that, um, to me, one of these just little mental exercises one can do sometimes is the, the Peggy Sue got married. Like, imagine you could go back and change something in your life, you know, like some stupid mistake. You, oh, I can't believe I did that. I wish I could go back and change that. Little exercise I've sometimes done is said, okay, well, I'm really frustrated I made mistake X. If I could go back and change that, but then I had to live my entire life forward from that point, would I? Right. And one of the reasons I never would is I'm like, do I really think I could just remake Eberron and that it would, <laughs> you know, again, <laughs> they got 12,000 entries right. for the fantasy setting search. The fact that they even found Eberron yep. in that haystack is pretty amazing. So I do definitely consider myself one of the luckiest nerds alive. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, so we're obviously going to spend a lot of time talking about Eberron, but before we do, what I'd like to find out um, before we transition is what do you play now? So um, is there anything non-Eberron related, non-D&D related that, that you find yourself playing and enjoying as a consumer? Uh, in the tabletop role playing? Uh, or it, uh, anywhere, field. sure. Because I play, you know, and bear in mind that, that my company, Together Studios, you know, we make games. So part of it is you got to play all kinds of things. Exactly. Uh, I, you know, my wife and I actually play games like Cribbage a lot just because, you know, it's, it's simple, quick, and, and it's a yeah. good game. Uh, so we'll do that a lot just over lunch. Uh, I love just looking at relatively recent things. One of my favorite games in the last couple of years is Onitama. Uh, I've seen it, not just, played it. I've heard it's great. It's really great. It's yeah. 10 minutes, but it's got a ton of replay value, and it is a strategic game, but you can't plan too far ahead. You have to deal with changing circumstances. So I love Onitama. Uh, so, you know, all sorts of things. Obviously playing a lot of the Adventure Zone recently, which is a sort of halfway mood. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. But, you know, halfway point between uh, TTRPGs and other games. Uh, in the role-playing front... Uh, I am playing an Eberron campaign. I'm just kicking off now uh, for my Patreon supporters. And I've also been playing a game just personally of, of D&D. Uh, beyond that, the last two big campaigns I've played have actually been unpublished uh, systems uh, that I've played with Dan Garrison, who is my co-author for Phoenix Dawn Command, the role-playing game we released a couple years ago. And of course, going back even farther, I played a ton of Phoenix because like when we were working on that, I was probably running three separate games of Phoenix a week just for all the play testing. Sure. Um, and so Dan definitely is a guy who just comes up with a lot of interesting ideas. And so that's the thing. When I talk to people and say, oh, you know, I'm playing this incredible game that I love. And they're like, well, what is it? And I'm like, well, it doesn't actually exist yet. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. There you go. That's very, very cool. Well, guys, the Insider Insights series is my opportunity to bring on writers, designers, developers, artists, and other tabletop gaming insiders to talk about what they do, why they do it, and really pull back the curtain on what they create. What I like to do is, is to understand the process. How does somebody like Keith go from just playing games to now making games and being a huge name in the industry. So the main things we're going to focus on today is where the concept and the setting of Eberron came from, what was the process of creating it and curating it over several editions, and then we're going to talk about some of the exciting stuff, which is what Keith and his wife are working on now. So let's take a quick break, and we're going to jump into the world of Eberron. We'll be right back. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. 
Howdy friends, Greg here. Nothing makes Malifaux easier than having the right tools. Here at the third floor, we love all the licensed Malifaux goodies from Custom Meeple. Not only are they helping support this podcast, they sell custom-made weird licensed tokens and terrain. They sell it all. Crew boxes, terrain, markers, tokens, and even a 3x3 full Malifaux board. Custom Meeple sells a complete M3E token set covering every marker and token you need to play. Custom Meeple are the source for the official accessories for Malifaux. Everything is designed by hand and authorized by Weird Games. Check them out at custommeeple.com, that's with one M, or follow the link in the show notes. Up your Malifaux game and be sure to tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. If you use the promo code third floor friend, all one word, T H I R D F L O O R F R I E N D, you'll get a 5% discount and help support the podcast. It's valid on everything except retail products and play mats. So as I mentioned, and as uh, my listeners already know, um, uh, Rumpelstiltskin and Craig woke up and suddenly the entire landscape of, of tabletop gaming and role-playing games had changed. And though um, I don't really play D&D, um, haven't d- dove back into D&D just because I've been finding all this other stuff, um, Every time the subject of D&D comes up, Eberron is part of the conversation. So finally, I was like, what the hell is Eberron? So I did some poking around and people who I have made friends with in the industry, um, this is the setting that they mention every single time. They're like, you know, and I'll say, I'm not really interested in D&D, but say, yeah, but have you tried Eberron yet? So, (laughs) Keith, for those that really have no idea what Eberron is, um, what is kind of the the elevator pitch? If someone says, you know, what the hell is Eberron? What do you think best describes it? So the uh, one sentence pitch that I gave Wizards when we started off, and unfortunately I can't remember the second sentence of it because there were two sentences, but the first sentence was uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Maltese Falcon meet Lord of the Rings. And basically, uh, Eberron combines two sort of core concepts. The one idea is that it starts by saying arcane magic, as presented in, at the time, 3rd edition D&D, behaves like a science. It's reliable. It's repeatable. There's rules for creating magic items. A wizard can create a spell and then teach that spell to another wizard. Everything about this behaves like a science. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't it have have the same impact on civilization that science had in our world. Interesting. And essentially, it takes that idea of saying, well, what if we imagined that in the Renaissance, what we had as science was arcane magic? What does the world look like 500 years later? So that was sort of this principle of let's actually imagine a society that is built on institutionalized and industrialized magic. Now, part of what some people mix it up with is things like steampunk. And one of the things that really clarify, you know, we want to always clarify there is from the very beginning, we said this is not about a world that has both magic and technology, like, for example, say Shadowrun. Right. This is about a world where magic is the science and has been used to solve the problems that we solved with technology. Right. Uh, so you mentioned earlier, I think, mechanical beings. What we have are the Warforged, and the point of the Warforged is they're not robots. Uh, what they are is industrialized golems. <laughs> you know, that basically the point is golems animating steel and stone. That is a science that exists in Eberron. So what if you could mass produce it? You know, so it's that right. kind of concept of saying this isn't just technology. This is the magic that exists in D&D, but what if you used it on a wider, more industrialized scale? And so I'll come back to that in a moment, but that's, that's concept one of what if you built a society on this science. Uh, the second aspect was to bring in the flavor of both pulp adventure, the Raiders of the Lost Ark point, Uh, And also sort of film noir, Casablanca, the Maltese Falcon, the big sleep, uh, which 
emphasize both we want over-the-top action, we want adventure, we want characters beating the odds, uh, but at the same time we want stories that aren't always going to end well, where you can't always tell who the bad guy is, and where there isn't always, you know, a good answer to your problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of the things I'll say is from the start, it was clear that we couldn't simply eliminate alignment, which otherwise we might have, because alignment is part of the D&D rule system, right. but we could change the way that you work with alignment. Um, one of the big things I'll throw in, you know, just as an example of that is within the world, two major NPCs, one is a lawful evil king, uh, the other is a neutral good queen. Um, one of them is a warmonger who wants to, uh, reignite war to, uh, conquer everybody. And the other is, is fighting for peace. And it's actually the lawful evil guy who's fighting for peace. <laughs> uh, it's that the, the good queen, uh, believes that she can make the world a better place and that she can fight a just war. And the evil king knows that that's not how war works, but he will torture and assassinate and murder to keep the peace. Interesting. And so basically, I, I think on a tiny level, one of the things I'd say is we basically said alignment determines how you will achieve your goals. It says nothing about what your goals are. Right. And so we pulled that point of saying, you might be a paladin. You can detect that guy is evil. That does not tell you if he's the bad guy in this scenario. Right. Right. And so that concept of just at a high level of saying we want to add more shades of gray, more basically challenging choices, while at the same time also, if that's not your jam, we want you to be having a fight on the deck of a crashing airship <laughs> as you're trying to get the Rod of Doom from, you know, the Order of the Emerald Claw. Sure. Um and and so it's sort of taking those three things and weaving them together, a society that in a sense felt more modern, uh, problems and stories that felt sort of deeper and uh, more complex, but then also making sure we have those big damn heroes right. uh, and, and over the top action. One of the other things also throw out is that this again being back 15 or 16 years ago at this point uh we also wanted a more complex view of monsters of essentially saying that intelligent creatures should be just as diverse as humans uh and there's no reason that orc or that goblin is inherently evil or even that dragon yeah uh you know that red dragon doesn't mean it's evil uh and so basically one of the things we've said you know, Eberron in a nutshell is uh, the bad guys are and the monsters aren't always bad guys and the bad guys aren't always <laughs> monsters. So if we go back, Keith, I mean, I would imagine before you pitched in the contest, Eberron, did it exist? No, it did not exist. OK. And so this is the thing is uh here I was, newly freelance, full-time freelancer. The contest came up, and I submitted seven different ideas. And everyone was the final idea I submitted. And part of it was just I thought it was fun. Yeah. I didn't think they'd actually go for it. I was just like, ooh, I'd like to do that. And part of that was for the previous three years, I had been working as lead designer on a pulp-themed MMORPG. Interesting. And that didn't come out. Uh, which is one of the reasons I quit, is I saw the writing on the wall and said, you know, here we go. Another three years down the drain. Uh, but I'd been watching a ton of Republic serials, you know, sort of immersing myself in that feel. And part of that initial spark for Ebron was, well, what happens if you just layered that onto D&D? Uh, I remember past that first story uh, thing, I had just a little paragraph long story I stuck on the, the first page thing. And the first one was Mickey Redblade was sharpening a dagger when she walked in. She was three <laughs> feet of trouble. The most beautiful halfling he'd ever seen. But he could see it in her eyes. She was in danger. Isn't that funny? <laughs> and, uh, and so part of it, like I said, was just, well, I've been living in this right. sort of pulp world, but I love fantasy. So what if you just put these together? Together, and then added that uh, to my my thing. I had that long time thing of why doesn't 
magic get treated like science when it acts like science. So that idea was not a new one for you then at that no, point. No, that had been around for a long time. Got it was it. something I'd actually incorporated into Fantasy Hero when I was running Fantasy Hero. Uh, but but as I said, I hadn't developed it out into a world uh, like everyone. I'll actually say it's funny when I go back to one of my high school campaigns, uh, part of it was that the elves were absolute jerks. The the Zill gnomes of Eberron actually kind of are inherited from my earlier gnomes and my elves in my previous uh, setting uh, because I have my elves basically taking the principle of uh, advanced magic. Uh, well, advanced science seems like magic. Well, I'm right. like, then advanced, advanced magic should seem like science. And essentially had the elves just literally, you know, a couple tech levels above everybody else. And then they were just completely taking advantage of everything and uh, and had their own little essentially cyberpunk kingdom off in the corner. Interesting. That, you know, they didn't want any of you primitives come over it. <laughs> And and so, as I say, that was very different than what we now have in Eberron, but it was a place that I'd explored. And again, not in D&D. Right. Uh, an idea of, of an advanced magical society. All right. So now you lose your lunch because you get picked, right? Right. Um, oh, it was crazy. Yeah. And, and now like holy crap now now you gotta like help put this together right i mean what is well and that was the point is that it wasn't a campaign i just had sitting around right. i just wrote a one-page idea and they said we like it and i'm like you do yeah uh so i had to make a world and, and so what i mean how does that even start keith <laughs> what's step one uh, well, I, I talk to people about world building and it's, it's, you know, to me, there's two ways to go. You start from a single point and you expand out or you start big and dig down. Uh, normally, I prefer starting from a single place and expanding. Uh, the campaign I'm just about to start right now with Eberron is starting with a town and building out from it. Uh, with Eberron, it needed to be an entire setting. Yeah from the start. So we had to start with the world as a whole. And there it was. Start with the the big civilizations. Start with the religions. Uh, start with major events, like the idea that there was essentially a major world war. Right. Uh, and, and sort of start with those big tent poles, in part going from what are the themes and how do we support that. Uh, the idea of the war all along was war drives industrial innovation. Uh, you know, war shakes up the, you know, a lot of, of sort of noir stories yep. are sort of either, you know, between pulp and noir. Take Raiders, you're dealing with the going into World War II. Right. Uh, and a lot of noir you're dealing with essentially the aftermath of World War One, mm -hmm. and and that was definitely that kind of flavor I wanted to deal with. Is a world that it's not just that they had magical industry, but it's that it was having an impact that you could feel that impact in things. So I'd be interested, Keith. I, so there's a couple ways that this can all come together, right? One way is you're consuming all of this. Um, very stylistic information, right? All consuming these these serial uh, serials. I'm sure a bunch of pulp novels. You're buried in it for work um, for the time yep. that you're working on the MMO, and and that's where you kind of frame up a lot of this. And then there's you know turning to actual history and understanding where these things fall relative to the different world wars. So that that war mm -hmm. leads to innovation. How much now that you look back on it was you applying? practical historical knowledge versus i know that i like noir i know that i like pulp and it turns out that's where they came from so it influenced everyone am i making any sense like how much of it was a conscious choice on your part do you oh, think oh absolutely a lot of it was a conscious okay. choice and and this comes back to that point that um i wanted to do this you know all my life yeah and so i'll say when i went to college there wasn't a game di design uh major but there was what i did was english and history because again this is the point to me of what i wanted was to understand stories right and so i was always interested in history folklore again going back to that i love the deities and demigods because i gotta pit my favorite you know uh myths against one another 
And and so to me, I've always been interested, you know, part of what I wanted with Eberron was a world that felt real to me. And one of the things I'll throw out is just one of the little ways that Eberron differs from the other major campaigns that were around at the time, Forgotten Realms, uh, Dragonlance, uh, was uh, decided from the start that gods would not manifest in the world, that you could never meet a god, that people believe in them, clerics have power, but there's no way for me to absolutely concretely prove that a cleric isn't a weird type of sorcerer or a Sidon or something like that. Yes, their magic comes from faith, but does that mean there's actually a god? We don't know. And part of the point of that was because when you have gods as you do in Forgotten Realms, you really don't have faith. Right. It is more like professional sports. Which (laughs) team are you on? Uh, You know, no one's going to say Bane doesn't exist because he literally is right over there. (laughs) Sure. Uh, don't, don't let him hear you. Yeah. And so a lot of the interesting things that happen in history, crusades fought for the wrong reasons, you know, all of these things, uh, heresy. How can you have a heresy when you can literally just, you know, go visit Thor for lunch and ask him to straighten this little uh, misunderstanding out? And so part of that was saying one of the things about Eberron is this needs to be a world where we don't have that kind of certainty. And where, in part, part of the point is that faith does matter, and it adds these same elements that we have in our world and our history. Yep. That you can have something like uh, what we call the um, uh, lycanthropic purge in uh, (laughs) Eberron, where one of the churches essentially wipes out like Hanthropes, largely as a public health service. Yeah. Uh, but basically part of the point is saying, yeah, and in retrospect, it was a terrible idea and a lot of people feel bad about it, but people make mistakes. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> uh, and, and just that idea, as I said, of heresy, that you can have a church devoted to a particular deity who can completely split over their interpretations, which didn't really work in like something like FR. Uh, so as I said, that was just one of those little points of saying, this is how the, these are right. the sorts of things that shape history and shape cultures. And we want that. We want to have those levels. That's things. fascinating. And, it, and it's funny because um, I think for people that are relatively new to role playing, the idea of this ambiguity, the idea mm-hmm. of of the mystery um, seems silly now. Right. Because it, it's everywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, back, no, back, back then, Keith, it wasn't. It, yeah, no. Things things were spelled out. And and uh, it, it's it's surprising how unique these concepts yep. were for the setting. So that that is no. that's pretty incredible. No. Likewise, uh, the idea of having orcs that weren't evil. Right. Nowadays, that is actually pretty much, ah, you shouldn't have people at the time. Yeah. That was a, you know, that was a, a big change. Uh, now, and, and that was one of the points, again, of trying to make things that felt real was saying uh, humanity essentially took the primary continent, Corvair, where everything happens, took it from the goblins, that the goblins were the uh, indigenous indigenous people, (laughs) uh, and humanity came in and and ended up taking the land. And part of the point was to say goblins are not evil, but they do have actually a very legitimate grievance against humanity. You did basically take their stuff and you're literally looting their tombs when you go dungeon raiding. And so what I wanted was to say, oh, we can have conflict between humans and goblins, but frankly, honestly, you're probably on the wrong side. Isn't that (laughs) you know? Um, There was one other thing I want to call out, just speaking of history again, uh, was also one of the shaping elements of Eberron was the idea of the dragon-marked houses. And uh, part of the idea is the dragon-marked houses are these uh, families that have a sort of a mystical innate gift that is a hereditary gift passed down through bloodline that lets them both, gives them a magical power, but also lets them essentially create tools that use that power uh, that are more efficient 
than other kinds of magic items that have allowed, over the course of a thousand years, these families to dominate fields of the magic economy. Interesting. So you have the House of Making, which creates the, uh, you know, the rails, the things, uh, the airships. There's a house that flies them, essentially equivalent to the Spacers Guild in uh, Dune, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, there is a house that handles the communications, you know, the, the telegraph equivalent. And the two sides of this were in part, I will go ahead and say this was somewhat inspired. I also love cyberpunk. This was somewhat inspired by the idea of the mega corporations right. of we're going to have these corporate entities that are in some, you know, we have a valid question as to whether these are becoming more powerful than nations. So on the one hand, you have that. And on the other hand, it was also very much uh, inspired by things like the Medicis, uh -huh. Thurman Taxes, you know, heck, the Rockefellers, uh, of saying that this, this, you know, concepts we can look to of families that become sort right. of influential monopolies. Very, very interesting. So guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back from this break, I want to talk about the evolution of Eberron. So we've got an under, a, a kind of an understanding of what it is, uh, where it came from, which um, quite honestly um, is different than what I expected, which is neat. Um, I, I just have this image of, of poor Keith going, holy crap, <laughs> <laughs> I've got some work to do. And But I want to talk about where it is now, um, how it changed over time, and um, we want to talk a little bit about mechanically what makes it different than, say, your traditional mm -hmm. Dungeon and Dragons. So we'll be right back. So, Keith, if um, some of my listeners are hardcore fifth edition, love D&D, have been playing it since Redbox, um, have heard of Eberron, never played for Eberron. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the mechanical differences. So alignment, for example, obviously is the first thing to call out because we discussed it. What are some other things mechanically that they should be aware of um, if they're going to dive into Aberon? Well, one of the things, of course, I should say, uh, alignment, we use it sort of uh, differently, but it's still there. Right. You know, so we didn't remove it. Uh, one of the things we did do that I'll just drop out uh, in which was relevant in third edition is we said that clerics don't have to have their alignment match their deity. Interesting. And that's a little difference, but it does actually make a difference because we were trying to push that idea that even the priests of the force of good don't actually necessarily do have to be things, good people. Yeah. Uh, and so that's just an example of saying little ways where we sort of said, well, we're keeping the, the basic foundation, but we're tweaking it a little. Um, honestly, fifth edition, it largely does try to uh, to run by the rules. Uh, one of the things we do, if you look to Rising uh, from the Last War, the core fifth edition Eberron source book, is right from the start, we do talk about how do you bring in the pulp or the noir flavor. And one of the things about that is we also say from the start that when we call it, we often describe it as pulp noir, uh, that's a spectrum. Right. You can go anywhere on that. You yep. can play the straight over the top big damn heroes doing good. You can play the gritty mean streets of Sharn, or you can go right down the middle in there. And um and so part of it is is we do provide sort of ideas. There's uh one of the things I suggest in Rising is a system of using environmental elements where it's basically add things to the the scene that if the players engage with them, they can, you know, get advantage. So if you're in a bar and you're having a fight, let's point out right from the start that there's a giant bonfire, there is a chandelier, there is a plate glass window. And if you swing on that chandelier, uh, you know, that's going to give you a bonus. In part because once you tell people there's a chandelier there, they're like, oh, I could swing on the chandelier. <laughs> people just often don't think about it. Sure. And so that's one of the things is, is you know, think about what's in that scene. Uh, looking to the noir aspect of it, one of the things we call out again isn't changing the rules, but it's calling out things like saying, well, think about what are your regrets? What are your mistakes? There's a table, one of my favorite tables I've created in uh, Rising from the Last War that is, uh, why do you need 200 gold pieces? 
and it was just a table for a beginning character to roll on or just pick one of the ideas of, oh, did you borrow money? Is there a bounty on your head? Uh, is it that, well, if you just got 200 gold pieces, you could get your magic sword out of Hawk? You know, uh, whatever it is. But it's that point of saying that having a problem right away can actually give you a story. You know, in a way that just being the perfect flawless person uh, might not be as interesting. The core mechanical differences, first off, are the races. Uh, Eberron introduces four unique races. The Warforged are the sort of most iconic of those, which are the sentient golems created for the last war. And uh, so if you want to play a magical robot, this is the, the race <laughs> for you. Uh, we also have changelings, which are a sort of subform of doppelganger, you know, just more balanced for PCs. Uh, Kalistar, who have sort of innate psychic abilities, they're bonded with spirits. And in third edition, this was basically the I wanted psionics to have a clear, controllable spot in the world. Right. And this is through the Kalistar. Uh, and shifters, who are sort of like thin blooded lycanthropes, you know, they can sort of assume a bestial aspect, but they don't fully change into other creatures interesting so those are four races that are you know were created for eberron uh but then in addition what eberron adds are the dragon marks and dragon marks are what i mentioned earlier with the dragon marked houses that there are 12 bloodlines that carry these innate magical gifts and part of the thing is if you play a dragon marked character that gives you abilities you know they are in fifth edition we did them as sub races Got so, it. you know, uh, but basically you get an innate set of abilities, but it also means you have a connection to the house. And part of the question is, do you embrace that? Are you proud of it? Are you working? You know, are you a company man or is it that you're an outcast? And if so, why are you an outcast? Are you sort of challenging your house? Uh, we also add what are called aberrant dragon marks, which are... Uh, in 5th edition is handled with a feat, but is basically you develop a sort of dangerous mutation huh. uh, that uh, the houses have spread propaganda about, so it's a little bit of getting that sort of X-Men people are going to fear you <laughs> sure. uh, element in. And uh, those are the core mechanical differences. What I'll say is that in 3rd edition, we also have what were called action points, which were a system that let players essentially beat the odds. Uh, but part of the point, as you were saying about how things have changed, is really ultimately we didn't add something for that here because basically that's inspiration. Right. You know, is that that's just part of the game now. Yep. But it was wanting that idea that the players had a little way to sort of push their luck and, and uh, change the things. And so, hey, we just encourage you to use inspiration. Um. I'm trying to think if there's any other absolute concrete uh, mechanical differences, but a lot of the focus, as I said, is more on the story. Right. And Rising does include things, like I said, ways to add more of that uh, sort of pulp flavor or noir flavor. And so there's certainly a lot of suggestions related to that. So how much over the years now and several editions of Dungeons and Dragons and, and as a result, editions of, of Eberron, how much has the world changed? Um, so if you were to go mm -hmm. back and look at mm -hmm. kind of its original published version to where we are now, how has the world changed? First, I want to give a quick shout out to the other people involved in the original world, because part of the point is, as you said, they said, make this world. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, and so I put something together. And that was what they chose. But then, uh, you know, we spent months working to create the first Eberron book. And that was with Christopher, you know, Chris Perkins, Bill Slavisek, uh, James Wyatt. Uh, and, you know, especially in terms of mechanics, uh, I was mostly the story guy. And, and, you know, like I think it was I think James did like seven versions of the Warforged, you know, and things like that. So I just want to give a shout out to all of them of that Eberron, as you know, it was was a group effort. Sure. Uh, as for where it's gone from there, it hasn't actually changed a lot. One of the things we decided with both going into fourth and going into fifth is uh, Forgotten Realms Often when it went into a new edition, they'd, they'd jump it forward in time. They'd add a big event like the Spell Plague. They'd change it up. And 
Eberron starts by default at this particular point in time, 998, uh, that it's right at the end of, of the last war, and, and basically all these different factors are carefully balanced. And what we basically said was, A, this is a perfect moment in time for things to start, and B, we don't actually want to invalidate everybody else's campaigns. Like when we were making it for fourth edition, we're like, if we move it forward 10 years, we've got to make a lot of decisions about what happened. Yep. And that could completely contradict what you did at home. Yep. So we would rather keep it in that same moment and let you extrapolate you know, okay, the mechanics have changed a little, but I can I can work that into my ongoing campaign rather than we change the world and you have to adapt to it. So the world didn't change much. Um, fourth to fifth, the main thing is like Dragon Marks had a different system. Yep. Um, Warforged had uh, very different rules. They Each edition, Warforged have completely changed. Oh, and of course, I forgot one of the big rules elements is the Artificer. Uh, and in 5th edition, it's important because actually that was the first official new class yep. that has been added. And now it is also in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. But again, the Artificer uh, was a very big thing from the beginning of making a new class where we were basically saying the whole point is magic is treated as a science. Well, here's the scientist that the wizard is a kind of, you know, wizards work with spells. The artificer is essentially the scientist who makes magic items. And uh, so that is also, that class has changed significantly between each edition to adapt to the new rules. Uh, but you have a fifth edition artificer. And part of it is because uh, fifth edition doesn't have magic item creation uh, quite as concrete as it was in third or prolific, but we still managed to come up with a version of the artificer that I quite like. So again, you don't make quite as many magic items as you might have in third, but you still get the flavor of I'm a person who can create temporary magic items. That, that That's interesting. So, I mean, when, when the first book got published, Keith, it, it had to have been um, a little bit earth shaking. Um, and, and I'd be curious for you as the creator, what was the initial feedback like? Um, so what it was, I mean, there's beyond play testing when it was unleashed on the world. Um, what were you hearing that surprised you? What were, what were you hearing that made you really happy? And was there things that you're hearing that were, you were like, that, that hurt your feelings for lack of a better uh, word. So first off, there were a couple things of, um, one of the, the main points, you know, on it is that I'd been freelancing for, you know, five or six years, you know, long enough that I thought, hey, maybe I can do this full time. Uh, now, the main point is I've been freelancing for companies like Goodman Games and Green Renine and, you know, successful companies, but not Wizards of the Coast. You right. know, uh, one <laughs> yeah. of the things that immediately came out was a lot of people complaining that I won because in their eyes, I was a professional. And the main point is that the fantasy setting search wasn't actually a contest you know a lot of to a lot of people it was uh american idol this is supposed to be complete <laughs> unknown gets published but when you actually go back and look at it it wasn't a contest it was an open call uh right. anybody could enter it including employees of wizards you know, I know for a fact James Wyatt submitted a couple entries to it. Like, it was not supposed to be we we find the great unknown. It was supposed to be we find the setting we love. Yep. Uh, now, having said that, I was still pretty much a great unknown. Yes, I'd been, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd got these couple of small things out there. But it wasn't like I was even at a point where I felt I could submit something to Wizards of the Coast. You know, sure. let alone... Uh, anything like that. So getting published, you know, something published by Wizards of the Coast was mind-blowing. But I remember in particular someone complaining about me winning on a message board and saying, this is like Kid Rock winning Star Search. And I'm just like, I don't even know which part of that insults me the most. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> Of all the analogies to draw. Yeah. And, and, and the other one that was a big thing that might have fed into that is that there is a designer who worked for Wizards of the Coast for a long time named Rich Baker. And a surprising number of people assumed that because my last name is Baker, we must be related. And that this was clearly super uncommon, ne name. Yeah, super uncommon name. It was clearly, <laughs> clearly nepotism. 
Um, oh, so, boy. So there was all of that. And there was also a lot of people who um, just initially dismissed the concept either because they're just like it's magical robots and dinosaurs on trains uh, or because of the basic idea that Eberron was designed. So uh, one of the core concepts that we say about Eberron is that if it exists in D&D, there's a place for it in Eberron. Now, the point is you have to parse that out correctly, which is there is a place for it. That does not mean it exists. It means if you want it to exist, you can put it in there. So a lot of... There's room for it. And that's intentionally because we created a number of large spots of the world that are basically big sandboxes waiting for you to fill. We have a realm called Zendrik that is literally an unmappable, you know, magically altered wilderness, which is the basic point of you want to drop the Abiel in, and we haven't said anything about the Abiel, that's B people to you, minor points. There's a golden hive city of Abiel in the midst of Zendrik that no person has ever laid eyes on until this moment. And right? again, the main point is I actually don't uh, use a whole lot of standard D&D stuff in my campaigns. I don't like a ton of sub races, so I just don't bother with them. You know, things like that. Yep. Uh, so it's not that Eberron is a crazy, kludgy kitchen sink, which a lot of people assumed. It's that it is flexible. And one of the big things I don't think we mentioned that I just want to call out is uh, one of the things that was a conscious design decision we said from the start is we're not answering every question. That right. Eberron is something that you should build on. Just like in the beginning when I would buy these adventures, but I wouldn't use them, I'd make them my own. And that was always yep. what I wanted from Eberron is you should make this your Eberron. One of the key points there is uh, I mentioned the last war, which was the sort of giant world war that sort of uh, set the current stage. That ended with an event called the Morning, where an entire nation was devastated in some kind of magical magical cataclysm and no one knows what caused it and so it's essentially a hiroshima nagasaki event but on a national scale and we don't know was it a bomb was it because people were using too much war magic and it was some kind of environmental thing we don't know but everyone stopped fighting because they're terrified so it's essentially a nuclear deterrent situation except we don't even know if it's a bomb and mm-hmm. uh, and part of that was coming back to history, is imagining the impact of that kind of unknown destruction and what that would do. But also part of the point is in 15 years, we have never given an answer for what caused the morning because we want you to decide. Right. And, and I'm sure it's happened, oh, yeah. right? I'm sure of all of the thousands oh, of yeah. Eberron campaigns that exist, that that was oh, answered, sure. right? Absolutely. And, and, and yeah, what that's... I love is if I go into your campaign and I will say I've played a number of Eberron campaigns where this has been an important plot point, And every time, of course, even though I made the world, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. And I get to experience that mystery, too. And that same principle applies to a lot of different points in the world. And so that comes up what I was saying about there's a place for everything. There's a place for everything. That doesn't mean it's there or that you have to use it. It means we want you to make the world your Eberron. Yep. Yeah, and, and it's none of it's written in stone. I mean, it, 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 we're making up stories. You made it up, too, right? Exactly. right? And there's no reason that um, people can't do that. So we talked a little bit about some of the burrs and spikes, but, I mean, everybody I talk to, Keith, and I'm not just blowing smoke, loves Eberron. And the, especially the people who love Eberron <laughs> really <laughs> love enough. Eberron. And, and so I'd be curious to know what it was like as a creator to see people just go, wow, this is amazing, and I finally get to tell the stories I've wanted to tell. I I can't even uh, express it. I mean, it really is mind-blowing. Like I say, this is something I wanted to do all my life. It was something I knew I would be able to do simply because it's a job. Again, I have this book. Someone made that book. So I knew I could do this, but I never expected oh, there's going to be my world in five different languages and, you know, I'm going to get letters from people in, you know, Israel and Bulgaria about how much they love Eberron. You know, like that, that's mind-blowing to me. 
And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I don't really know what to say other than that I feel, you know, very lucky and that it always is thrilling to me uh, to see what people do with it. That was going to be my next question, actually, because um, uh, I think it was John Harper that said to me, you know, when he creates the analogy he uses in his head is he's creating musical instruments and he loves to see people playing them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be interested for you, especially after all these years, I'm, you've seen other people take your world and make it theirs. Is there anything you can think of off your hand that you came across or heard about or saw firsthand where you went, wow, like you kind of just blew my mind what you did with the table I set. Is there anything that comes to mind when I say that? <sighs> oh, there ought to be. And I'm sure I will think of a dozen <laughs> things uh, when I'm done. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll say it's, it's a big thing now uh, just because when Eberron first came out, uh, it could only be, you could only publish it with Wizards of the Coast. You know, people could do their own stuff, but it's not like I saw a lot of it. You know, right. I didn't know what Good people point. were doing. Uh, I will say that now it's it is available. People can write their own Eberron content uh, on the DMs Guild, and and so just seeing all the things that people do come up with, even if I don't actually you know read a lot of them or whatever, just because time. Sure. Uh, it's just very you know humbling and amazing to see all the things that come out there. I mean, I'll also say just random things. One of the huge things, yeah, and just a couple things that come to mind uh, are you know the fact that D and D online was set in Eberron, and that you know as a guy who worked in the computer game industry for a long time, yeah. it's kind of crazy to be like, oh, there's an MMO that's in my world, <laughs> you know. And I'll say a big thing like this isn't as exciting as the hard work someone's put into a campaign or something like that. But the first time I saw someone in Eberron cosplay. Uh, oh, and I will yeah. say most recently, there's some guy, if you just Google Lord of Blades uh, cosplay, there's a guy who's doing a costume of one of the characters, the Lord of Blades. And it is one of the most amazing things I've seen, Eberron or otherwise. And so seeing that kind of thing or seeing the people who have Dragon Mark tattoos or things like that. God, and, that's got to be incredible. And I think the thing that actually is amazing to me uh, which has happened more recently in the last two years, I'd say, you know, uh, really with the release of it for fifth edition, um, is having people come up to me and say, oh, I first played Eberron when I was in high school and it was my introduction to D&D. &D. And as a guy who first started playing D&D &D in high school, yeah. that moment of, oh, wait, for you, that was Eberron. Like that yeah. blows my mind of of just someone who it was their first experience of D and D. I can't even imagine what that was like. And sure. So it is a crazy thing to think that that some people their experience was my world. That's that's crazy. And I mean, maybe this is maybe this is not the case, but I, I'd have I would believe you if you told me. I'm not going to call you a liar, but there are times you just get tired of it. That you're like, I, the last thing I really want to think about is Eberron? No, honestly not. I mean, uh, it's it's really funny. I'd say it's the reverse, that uh, it was actually very, very hard over the sort of big gap between uh, fourth edition and rising from the last war because I couldn't officially write Eberron material. Oh, right. And that was actually why I made Phoenix Dawn Command was because I couldn't make, uh, any kind of Eberron material because wizards own the world and I wanted yep. to do something. So I made Phoenix. Uh, but I've always loved Eberron and part of it is because the world is so big that there's always been things that we haven't been able to talk about. Right. And so, uh, my book rising from the last, uh, no, not rising from the last war. That's the book. Um, <laughs> exploring Eberron is, uh, a book I released earlier, well, late in, in 2020, uh, on the DM Guild. And part of the point of exploring Eberron was now that anyone can, including me, write the uh, Eberron stuff for the DMs Guild, this was an opportunity for me to finally write about parts of Eberron that I never had a chance to write about Isn't in the official something? books, such as aquatic civilizations, the plains, more about actually the weapons used in the war, you know, and these were things that I always wanted to talk about but never could. Because again, when you're dealing with a the world, there's it's so big. There's always going to be pieces. 
yep. that uh, that you never get about. So so honestly, I I always do just love talking about it or hearing people's stories or things like that. That's not to say I don't like the other projects that I work on as well. I really would like to get back to Phoenix Dawn Command sometime because I really enjoyed it. Uh, but right now I'm got my hands full between Eberron and the Adventure Zone. So was it was it freeing to a certain degree, Keith, to be f- free of wizards for a little bit? Well, I mean, you know, again, I've always been free of wizards. You know, they bought the rights. Maybe that's not the way to think. Yeah, Uh, I'm trying to think of the way to put it. Um, To be able to create without them around. Maybe that's another way to put it. So when we talk about Phoenix. That's that's my thing is is I I think the point to me is that wizards never was uh, sort of a dominating factor in my life. You know, even when. Uh, when you look to before Eberron, part of the point is I was writing over the edge stuff. I did right. things for um, Ars Magica, you know. So, like I say, I've never felt that oh, I'm I'm just trapped by D and D. And even after Eberron came out, I still worked on a lot of of different things. In part because again, Wizards owned the rights. I couldn't write my own Eberron stuff. Um, so it wasn't really an imposition. Uh, I will say that it was fun. You know, basically before Phoenix, I actually came up with a whole different, I basically said, well, I'm just going to make a fantasy setting from scratch. And actually a funny thing about it is I said, well, I'm going to make it system neutral. So mm-hmm. you can try with different systems. And one of the first systems I played it with uh, was, I know you've spoken to, to John Harper. I actually adapted Lady Blackbird. You know, <laughs> no to my kidding. early games for it, yeah, and um, so and so basically, I was working on that, and and a second aspect of that, one of the tools I used in developing that setting, which I highly recommend. It was a lot of fun, and I got great results. Was I actually created a fiasco playset? Uh, essentially, if you, for those of you who know Eberron, I basically took the equivalent of Sharn, you know, here's the coolest city in this setting, and I made a fiasco playset set in that, uh, that city, and I played that with a bunch of people just to see what stories will people make up in, you know, given this setting. And so that was interesting. And then, uh, it was actually, I was tossing around different ideas with my friend Dan Garrison, who I mentioned earlier. And in one of these conversations, he said, you know, it'd be interesting, a game in which a role playing game in which death was how your character leveled up. Uh, If basically you took what is traditionally the worst part of a role playing game, dying, and combined it with traditionally the best part, leveling up. Uh, And I was just like, Hmm, let me think about that. And, yeah. and that became Phoenix because I just loved the idea so much that uh, and what we ended up doing there was saying, OK, but if you're going to go with this and really embrace it, you kind of need a system driven by it. Right. Because um, it doesn't, you know, a lot of people said, why don't you just do it with D&D? And I'm like, because D&D isn't made with that in mind. It doesn't the narrative structure of D&D doesn't really support it. Mm -hmm. Um, part of what drives Phoenix is sacrifice and you have to have the ability to sort of make heroic sacrifices to make the story work. Uh, but anyhow, so yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Well, it does. I mean, it, um, it's, it's far more cliched for you to say, yes, Craig, it was great to be out from the, the dark overlords of Wizards of the Coast, but I think it's great that it didn't feel like that for you. It doesn't feel like that for you. That's I really I mean, uh, not to be cheesy, but it makes me happy that that oh, yeah. that it, it has been a good thing for you um, now creatively. Now, to be to be clear, I'll just throw out. I mean, it was frustrating that I couldn't just create stuff on my own. Had to have been, yeah. you know, and that was very frustrating. But again, that was just I knew I was getting into that when I sold right. them the rights. You know, I mean, that wasn't like a surprise. <laughs> they weren't mean about it. <laughs> you can't uh, get mad at the fire for being hot after you said it. right? Exactly. <laughs> um, and it's funny, you know, I uh, will just say part of the thing is a lot of people say to me like, oh, how could you do that? Oh, that's terrible. That you had to do that. And I'm like, not really. I mean, I made it up. You know, yeah. like it wasn't again, it wasn't like Ed Greenwood with this is his personal campaign for a decade. I made it up for the, you know, yeah. so, uh, so yeah. And it was huge for me. In, in some ways I would imagine Keith, it was born in that ecosystem to begin with, right? It's not yeah, something yeah. you brought in a suitcase and gave over to somebody. No, no. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, and, and what I will say is that was part of what drove Phoenix is, okay, this is something I would create and control from the ground up 
yep. from the very beginning. Whereas Eberron was something I built with those people I mentioned. You know, it was yep. my idea, but the end result is the result of a lot of different people's work. Um, and, um, I definitely get the impression that especially from a creative aspect, it doesn't, and, no, and no. that's fantastic. It speaks to the relationship that you have. No, uh, I, both, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's good. That's a good thing. Um, so, guys, we're going to take a quick break. Um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact um, that I'm talking to somebody who's seen it all, that's been through really all of the different changes of uh, the industry, um, the phases, the fads, uh, what stuck, what didn't, what's different now versus 20 years ago. And we're going to talk about the industry in general. So we'll be right back. Howdy friends, Craig here. You deserve a new playmat. Here on the third floor, we use mats by Mars. They are scratch resistant, waterproof, wet erase marker compatible, almost free of glare and lighter than neoprene. Mats by Mars gives you over 40 designs to choose from. You pick a mat, pick a design, and then you pick an overlay, like one for Marvel Crisis Protocol, Star Wars Legion, or even Malifaux 3rd Edition. Those overlays will really speed up your deployment and make the placement of objective markers so easy. Use our promotion code in the show notes to get a 10% discount on your first order. In the notes of your order, you can even request the third floor logo on your mat for free. That makes the best mat in the business even a little better. So get some new mats, save yourself some money, and help support the show. Go to matsbymars.com. All the details are in the show notes, including the discount code. So I mentioned um, at the very beginning of this episode, and people have heard me talk about it before, how my mind was kind of blown uh, back uh, at the beginning of COVID when I finally um, went back to my ex-girlfriend uh, RPGs and fell in love again. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget the first like four or five weeks where I said, you know what, I'm going to run a, a role playing game again. I haven't done it in 25, 30 years and I'm going to do it again. And uh, I got super excited about it and I went out searching, looking and was stunned, just absolutely stunned, Keith, at how much was out there and how popular role playing had become and how many different things. I mean, you've got to remember when I left, there was I'm not even sure there was even third edition yet. There probably was third edition D&D at that point. There was GURPS. Um, there was the old Star Wars uh, there was, um, you know, TSR, <laughs> there was no wizards. Um, wizards had just started, uh, putting out magic, the gathering. I was part of the beta for magic, the gathering. They hadn't even bought TSR at that point. Calus um, yeah. So, and then, you know, I come back and, you know, everything has happened. So I'd be curious for you, Keith, um, you know, looking back over the last 10, 15 years, um, First off, what do you look at as being some landmarks, some things where you felt like that, that. That, that impacted the industry, things that changed the game, whether it be systems like Powered by the Apocalypse, was that a big deal? Or were there other things that you saw happen that either then you knew was like, this is a big deal, or looking back on it, you're like, that changes everything. Are some of those things that you can think of? Well, I'll say that I've never uh, sort of purported to be or would class myself as, as sort of an expert who at this stage has played everything. Uh, certainly <laughs> when I started off, I played everything. Sure. Uh, but I'll say that there are a lot of systems like I've never actually played fate. You mm -hmm. know, I hear great things about it. I've never played savage worlds. Uh, and again, heard great things about it, have friends who love right. it. It's just a sort of hours in the day sort of thing. So part of the point to me is I think that one of the great things about this point is we have such a vast scope of compelling things to play. Um, I will say, actually, I really, when I started this, I'm going to make a new world. I didn't want to make a new system because yeah. I was like, there's enough out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up making one with Phoenix because there I was like, OK, we need a system that does a very specific thing. Uh, but with the original game, as I said, the original setting, I was actually planning it to be, I want you to be able to play this with, with some of the other great systems that are out there. I will say for me, I do feel something that was a bit of a game changer was um, Fiasco. Uh, because that was a real step in the just tell your story. Yeah. You know, that... Uh, 
we can have a role playing game that isn't about numbers and isn't about things and that in fact is made as a one shot mm-hmm. you know um and that's the thing is is i like one shots but i think that's that's the point is is i find it interesting things that do say this is a game made for one shots as opposed to made for a campaign uh but in general i think and this goes to powered by the apocalypse as well for sure uh you know games that basically do push towards this is about a collaborative story mm-hmm. rather than simply you know D D has always had in its basic dna that it is a war game and, Interesting. Uh, you know, I remember back with uh, the white box, you know, it was chain mail, you know, yeah. and it's always got the basic at the end of the day, hit points, armor class, uh, attack rolls. You know, if you are not playing a campaign in which combat at least is a, a you know, significant part, there's just better games to play, you know, and uh, I do appreciate that 5th edition has worked to really add depth and encourage, you know, with inspiration, with flaws, all of that. But it's still, it's D&D. Sure. And whereas, uh, you know, Powered by the Apocalypse really jumps into the idea of sort of bonds and connections between players. Fiasco goes all the, the, the other way and says, we, aren't even, we don't even have stats. We are just <laughs> literally don't have a game master. Yeah. You know, this is just something we are building together and there are no wrong answers. Um, and, and you know, that's ultimately what it comes down to me because, of course, I remember the, the big hullabaloo when 4th edition came out. And my thing is I like 4th edition and for that matter, uh, 13th Age, which spun off from that. Yep. I like 5th edition. To me, it's all about there is no one perfect game. Every system does something. You know, I made Phoenix because, uh, again, Phoenix is designed to tell a particular type of story. If you want to, you know, t- do a peaceful uh, social game, Phoenix isn't the system for that. Right. Um, and so, and, and literally, that was where I was going with Codex. The other setting I mentioned is part of my idea was not just to make it so that you could play it with any uh, any system, but actually to encourage people, don't be limited to one. Yeah. That if you're doing a court intrigue scenario, switch your system to something that's better <laughs> at court intrigue. Yeah. Uh, and the funny thing about that is I hadn't thought about it till now, but I mentioned Element Masters way back at the beginning. As And Element Masters was a classic role-playing game, characters, game master. There was one point when I was running that when we got to a big Helm's Deep style climactic battle. And essentially, rather than try to run that somehow in uh, Element Masters, which was not designed as a mass combat system, I just said, tell you what, we're going to play Warhammer and I'm going to put your characters in control of these squads. And yep. we played this, the battle out in Warhammer. And, and then we something. went back to Element Masters and dealt with the fallout. Yeah. And and that's, you know, part of the thing I'd say is don't be afraid to to stop and say, is there a better system for the story I want to tell, even within one campaign? Um, with that said, I basically I think that's the important thing to me is don't feel like you have to find the one perfect system. Uh, recognize the strengths of the system you're using, figure out what it is you want. Yeah. And, uh, and be willing to, to sort of just play whatever it is that is, is best for the story you want to tell. Well, and I can tell you as somebody who left and came back, one of the things that, you know, the trend when I was leaving was, Mm -hmm. um, is let's, let's create systems that can take it all in. Right. GURPS was starting to become more popular. The concept of of opening things up, you can tell you can tell whatever st- whatever you want to do, you can do with our system. Right. Uh, the hero system was another one yeah, that, that leaned towards that as well. I come back and I'm finding games like Blades in the Dark, yeah, which yeah. is this is this system does one thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and it does it really well. But that's that this is the type of story you're going to tell when you play this. And I found it very interesting to see that that when I came back. Yeah. And, and that's exactly as I said, that's Phoenix. Phoenix yeah. is a supernatural war story. 
Yep. And that's what it's designed to do, you know? And, uh, and I like that because again, you're not trying to have one tool for everything. You're saying, you know, let's, let's make the best thing. I'll say one of the uh, two other just things I love as innovations having encountered i mentioned blades uh, not blades in the dark uh, lady blackbird yes and i loved in lady blackbird the i think they're the keys if i'm remembering correctly that the way you gain experience in lady blackbird is by doing a certain thing and i remember uh at a convention i was played two games back to back a DD game and a blackbird hack that uh, a friend of mine was writing that was a cyberpunk game. In one of them, the D&D game, I was playing a bard. And I'm like, well, I'm going to try and be funny and clever because I'm a bard. But it wasn't like there was any reason for me to do that. That was purely right. just me trying to do yep. that. Then I'm playing in the next game, and my three keys were I got experience, not from killing anything. It didn't matter to me if you killed a goblin. But I got experience from making people laugh from telling a lie and having people believe me and from escaping. So like the only reason I want to get into a fight is so I could escape from it. Right. Uh, but also that me getting people to laugh, that was what I needed to do. And it was just this amazing twist of in this one, I'm trying to be funny because I guess it seems like it a good idea. And in the other one is like, no, I'm being funny because that literally is how my character will improve. And I loved that kind of uh, one of the, the keys that was tied to that was the idea of having a key of the leader that is you get experience when people follow your plan. And I love that after years and years of saying, oh, Bob's the team leader and we hope Bob is smart to instead saying, oh, no, if Bob is the leader, he yep. will improve. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it was just a new way of, of looking at that. Yeah, the idea of personalized XP triggers, right? Yeah. And and yeah. encouraging, uh, codifying the the concept of what you're talking about. Like, I'm a yeah. bard, so I'm going to act like a bard, but not because it gains me experience. Right. You know, tying that and building that into the game, I think, is is very, very fascinating. Now, the mm -hmm. please. Oh, I was going to say, and, and the one other just little mechanic when I think over the history of, of role-playing games, that this is much older, but I still love it. And uh, it's something I've used in a lot of things. And it really clicked to me with the let's get beyond dice and tell stories. And that was in Over the Edge, uh, Robin Laws, who has done many fine games, yep. uh, added a mechanic called the cut-ups method. And uh, Over the Edge was a game that by default used six-sided dice. And you'd have a pool of between three to five six-sided dice to accomplish what you were trying to do. The cut-ups method said, okay, if you're doing something that is more, seems too significant or creative or interesting to just be resolved by throwing some dice. Instead, as the game master, I'm going to randomly grab a book and I'm going to give you a number of words equal to the dice that you would normally get. So I'm just going to look at this book and grab the first four words that uh, catch my eye. And I am going to say finished, uh, bullshit, uh, <laughs> bleed, and four. And now you have to take those four words and come up with about a paragraph, no more, describing the action that you are trying to accomplish. I'm going to look at each word and say, how strong is the use of this word? Give it a value based on that. Interesting. And uh, how I usually use this, you know, in various ways and used it after Over the Edge, just still in systems, would be for things like ritual magic, like mad science uh. or things like that. And part of the point is to say, uh, you know, you've got the sorcerer. When he starts to cast the spell, he may not even know exactly what he's going to get. He's going to say, give me my words and let me see what I can do with this. Interesting. And uh, my another of my favorite role-playing moments, I mentioned the, the do we bomb the thing. Another <laughs> one that I will always remember uh, was a group of Over the Edge players. And uh, one of the characters for, uh, well, she was playing a character. Her character was a the astral projection of a ninja in a coma. 
like you do. Okay. <laughs> and uh, she was a fairly new role player, and she had uh, decided just as a goal for her character that she wanted to kill every actor who played James Bond. Like you do. Right. Uh, so, okay, I'm working with this. This is a sandboxy sort of campaign. But she is in this this uh, casino where basically any kind of deal can be made. And so I say we've got Sean Connery there. So she challenges Sean Connery to this duel, which ends up being a, a karaoke duel to the death. Because she can't fight him. She's a, she's a, a ghost. Uh, so we agree that we're going to have a karaoke duel. The loser will have their soul trapped in a little Tamagotchi that the other person keeps. Uh, so this is a perfect example where I'm like, just rolling a die isn't going to do this. Right? So I gave her her four words. She, on the spot, in the space of a minute, wrote a song and sang song. it. And <laughs> I was just like, yeah, you win. I did like a little <laughs> bit of Sean Connery doing my way and then oh, as he gets sucked into the Tamagotchi. But I was just like, I can't, That's I cool. can't beat that. It was a yeah, fantastic uh, creative moment. So I loved things like that where the point was it's a tool that encourages creativity. Don't just roll the die. Think about what you're doing and what you yeah. want to have happen. Yep. Yeah, very interesting. So the last part before we start talking about Adventure Zone, Keith, is I want to get your insights on what happened to this industry. Um, when I left, it was um, not a popular industry. It was hard to find kids to play with. It was hard to find adults to play with, even harder to find adults to play with. I come back and it's everywhere. And movie stars play it. And there is... Just, I mean, a drive drive through RPG exists for crying out loud. It didn't exist before, you know, um, itch and stuff like that. Like it is everywhere. And I would like to know what, what happened in your mind, Keith? What caused the explosion? I think one of the, the big things we have to just note is uh, is role playing happened. So part of the point is my saying I talk to people now in their 30s who are like, Eberron was the game I played in high school. And yeah. that's the point. You say movie stars played it. And I'm like, yeah, because they probably played it in high school. Yeah. You know, that uh, that it we are now a generation of people when you and I were growing up. This didn't exist. Like, this is the True. thing is, is when I look to like my parents, I'm like, of course, they don't understand what I do because it wasn't a job a good when they were growing up. Now they teach game design in college. Yeah. And so part of what I'm saying is it's just become, it's sunk in in ways that didn't exist when you and I were starting out. Uh, and I think that also just, you know, one has to give uh, credit to things like uh, the Guild, Tabletop, and, of course, Critical Role. Yep. Of uh, it's it's not just that movie stars are playing it, but people can see movie stars play it and say, right. well, if that cool person is doing this, must not be so bad. And having fun. Exactly. And yep. And I think also there are a lot of systems that – you know, frankly, are easier to get into than yep. D&D. Uh, but also D&D has, you know, certainly been helped by things like Stranger Things, uh, you know, and people, uh, you know, people can see it. Or, for example, since we're about to talk about it, the Adventure Zone. Mm -hmm. Where the point of the point is the Adventure Zone is just a way for people, an accessible way for people to hear what D&D is like and what's fun about it. And yep. say, I want to have that fun. Yep. Yep. No, I think that's very true. I had not thought about the generational thing, Keith, and I'm a little <laughs> mad at myself because it seems so freaking obvious when you said it out loud. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, uh, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, uh, say no to evil or there is no evil. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, um, I, I think it's say no to evil, but it's something yeah, like that. Yeah, say no to evil. I bought it for my daughter who's yep. just turned seven. Yeah. And, you know, I've been like showing her and she's like surprisingly completely gets it right out of the gate. Right. Uh, which gets to the point that you talked about at the very beginning. Right. Um, but that's not something my parents would have ever sat down and done with me. Um and that's a perfect example couldn't. of that generational. Yeah. You know, yeah. But that's the point is I don't have kids, but I'm old enough that I could have kids. And if sure. I did, you better believe I'd have been playing D&D &D with them. Yep. Yep. I had not thought about that. 
But so what's interesting interesting to me about it, and, and this is it, it's explained by the second half of what you talked about, is we haven't, I mean, we've seen a growth in, say, tabletop miniatures, right? Tabletop yeah, miniatures sure. are bigger now than they were 20 years ago, but it just seems more exponential on the ARP on the role playing front. Um, and, you know, I'm not surprised by it because I've always said, even though I was, you know, always have been a tabletop miniature player through all of this time, even when I wasn't doing role playing games, even that I told people the epitome of gaming is role playing. Mm -hmm. I love miniature gaming, but it's not the pinnacle. The pinnacle is role playing. So I'm not surprised that role playing has surpassed in popularity, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, but I just, I guess, I guess I've never quite put my finger on it, but the generational aspect of it's very interesting, Keith. So great call on your part. No, and it's interesting of, I'll say one of the things with fourth edition D&D, a lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people said, oh, it takes too much from computer games. But I will say, I remember a time during fourth edition where I introduced a woman who never played a role-playing game before uh, to fourth edition, and she just got it. Yeah. And the reason she got it was because she'd played EverQuest. <laughs> and so that whole, oh, it's kind of like an MMO. Yeah, but on the other hand, if you want to bring someone who's played an MMO and never a tabletop game, that's not a bad thing. You know, it's 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 all that back to each system does something good. Right. Not every system is for every person. And yeah. that was, as I said, what was amazing in that moment is I was like, oh, you are this is what this is for, <laughs> you know? So. Yep. Yep. Well, and the other thing that I was really pleased to see Keith, when I came back into the role playing game is um, how much more inclusive and diverse oh, for sure. uh, this universe is a, when I left it, I mean, it's exponentially more uh, inclusive and, and diverse than when I left it, but more than the other geek hobbies. Um, and, you know, I had a conversation with my wife about it. And who has no, like, this is, I have a, the reason it's called Third Floor Wars is that the third floor of my house is my studio, right? And that's because my wife doesn't want to see it, doesn't mm -hmm. have any interest in this. And that's, you know, that's her thing. But I asked her about this and she said, of course, Craig, it makes sense. Why would, why it would be far more inclusive and, and welcoming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because of just the nature of what role playing games are. Mm -hmm. um, do you, um, do you feel that the industry is headed in the right direction as far as that's concerned? I feel it's headed in the right direction. You know, I mean, I still think the question is uh, how long will it take, you know, to get there, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, what what is involved and required and uh, how long will it take to, to go? But I think that's true of society in general, you know, is is we're all on a journey. Uh, and I think the important thing is that people are willing to take that journey and to keep going, keep moving forward. Do you see do you see this in this part of the industry being ahead of the curve a little bit as far as that's concerned or is that being a little bit too optimistic? I don't know. I I I have to say this is part of where uh I feel like I haven't actually played enough of the other things that are out there uh to really feel like oh I could call myself an authority and make some kind of of broad statement uh like that. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I yeah. I feel like I've seen I've I see a lot of positive voices uh, and things like that. So I hope it is. I love when I go on Twitch mm -hmm. and look at actual plays. I love as I flip through channels, how many different voices and faces that I see. Yeah, no, absolutely. and that just that just makes me happy. It just makes me happy. And it uh, again, you know, it's in comparison to where I left it. Um, oh, yeah, for so, sure. So it pleases me. It really, really does. All right. So enough about this freaking D&D Eberron stuff. I want to talk about Adventure Zone. So let's take a quick break and uh, we're going to learn what Keith's latest project has been. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm James Hahn, and I'm a patron of Third Floor Wars because I'm a henchman who loses most of his games, and the podcast has tons of valuable information to improve your play as well as what to expect from other crews. You can support them too. The link is in the show notes, or just search for Third Floor Wars on Patreon.com. What is it worth to you to get this podcast on a weekly basis? Is it worth a dollar a month? $5 a month? $20 a month? If you'd like to help support the work that we're doing here on Third Floor Wars, please go buy our Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash thirdfloorwars. There you can pledge at any level, any dollar amount. 
Whatever you give us will help us put out quality content on a regular basis and hopefully make tabletop gaming a little bit better for you every week. Time to give a shout out to our newest patrons. A big special thanks goes to James Kahn, Rage Quit Wire, Deck Roll, Aloy, Robo Rotten, Jacob Suderman, Joshua Hatch, Donald Kroger, John Fox, and David Gadea. Because of you and the 100 plus that are supporting us on Patreon, we're able to put out regular content on a weekly basis. We appreciate it. There are so many online retailers. It can be hard to find one that is trustworthy, has great prices, along with some reliable customer service. On the third floor, we love ordering our gaming goodies from Gadzooks Gaming. Their selection of terrain, miniatures, dice, custom decor, and conversion bits are curated for gamers by gamers. You'll find they have what you need and what you didn't know you needed to take your gaming fun to the next level. If you mention Third Floor Wars in the cart notes of your order, you'll also get a free gift. And you'll help support the podcast. Check out gadzooksgaming.com and mention Third Floor Wars on checkout to get that free gift. So um, when I reached out to Keith and he was kind enough to uh, reply back and let alone say, yeah, Craig, I'll waste two hours talking to you. Um, you know, one of the things that I you know, asked him is uh, obviously I want to talk about Eberron. And I said, but uh, what 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 is something newer than Eberron or something maybe that you would like us to focus on? And without hesitation, he brought up Adventure Zone, which I had not heard of um, until Keith mentioned it. And I did some diving on it. And it's a very interesting idea. So, Keith, can you describe for those listening what Adventure Zone is? OK, well, to be clear, what I've worked on is the Adventure Zone Bureau of Balance which okay. is a collaborative storytelling game based on The Adventure Zone. Uh, and The Adventure Zone is a podcast uh, done by the McElroy family, previously best known for My Brother, My Brother and Me. And it's an actual play uh, between three brothers and their dad. Uh, and that just started off with them diving into the lost mines of Fandelver and just <laughs> going from there and turned into basically a, a measure of their whole campaign. Uh, and we just got to know them randomly, essentially, and, uh, you know, talked about making a game. And when we first talked about making a game, a lot of people were like, well, isn't the Adventure Zone game Dungeons and Dragons? Because it's based on a podcast that they played Dungeons and Dragons. And the thing is, yes and no. <laughs> of, yes, they were playing Dungeons and Dragons, but part of what people love about the Adventure Zone is really more this experience of a family playing a game together. Part of the point is that, well, most of the players didn't know the rules that well, and they weren't really that concerned with the rules, and that wasn't really what it was about. It was about this funny story they built together. And... A lot of people who like the Adventure Zone have never played D&D. Right. Uh, and part of what we wanted with the game we were making, so we were trying to say is, okay, that's the experience we're looking for, is not play D&D, because if you want to do that, play D&D. Right. But we're saying we want a thing where basically you can get together with some friends and in no more than 90 minutes... You can create just a fun fantasy story that everybody loves. Huh. And most importantly, that this is something you can do with a group of friends who have never played a role-playing game and, for that matter, never heard the Adventure Zone. Um, so what we wanted is we wanted to create something that part of the, the sort of stumbling blocks to D&D are worrying about all the rules, worrying about yep. all the numbers, and of course the prep time it takes getting a game master, uh, you know, to put something together. And so it's important to us with the Adventure Zone that it doesn't take a game master. You have one player who acts as the team leader, and the role of the team leader is know the rules, which is basically like saying if you're playing Monopoly, someone's got to be the banker. Right. They are going to play the game just like everyone else, but they take responsibility for I know how it works. Mm -hmm. No one else really has to. I can, I, I'll walk you through it as we go. 
Um, so with Bureau of Balance, you uh, you each make characters. So uh, you have you know the wizard, the fighter, the bard, the the rogue, the priest, and it's your classic fantasy archetypes each has a couple you know they're good against certain types of challenges they have certain special abilities but they're pretty simple and the main decisions you you make when making your quest character are answering three questions uh about your character you know i am a priest and a what i'm a centaur i'm a you know uh investigative journalist you know what i mean but i'm a priest and a something uh i am good against undead and spooky challenges because of and you know is it is it my my great wisdom my deep experience my channeling of the light you know my <laughs> my dramatic holy symbol um and uh, when you help your friends what is it that you use to help your friends your common sense your inspirational magic you know what is what is it that you do um the adventures are created using challenge decks. There's 12 in the game, and basically a, a mission is made up of a villain, a relic, and a location. Okay. So you need to, as, as reclaimers of the Bureau of Balance, you need to reclaim a relic uh, from the nefarious villain who has it, uh, and you have to basically get to the bottom of the relic deck, reclaiming the relic, and then either defeat the villain or the location deck uh so either escape the location or defeat the villain decks are 10 cards and they're double-sided which means even if you play the same deck twice you're not necessarily going to see the same thing right each deck both has different story but also different rules different challenges things like that so given that you have four of each sort of if you combine different things it will create a very different experience beyond that the decks themselves are intentionally fairly broad in concept and one of the first things you do is the team leader guides the rest of the team we're going to say well who are you all let's introduce our characters and now we're going to say well we know that we are trying to get the staff from the dragon in the cave but the first thing we're going to say is well let's talk about the dragon we know he's huge and dangerous and scary but like what's his name how what do we know about him what's what are what's a legend we've heard about this dragon what is the staff you know, it's incredibly powerful and it controls the elements, but, you know, what do you call it? And what do we know? You know, so basically the first part is saying we've got a foundation. We right. all know that this is the basic story, but let's just start going around and dropping details on it. And you're going to say, oh, it's Trogdor, the Burninator, you know, and I'm going to say, great. And uh, the staff is the staff of eternal winter. And if Trogdor can get it, fire and ice will overwarm the land, you know, and... So by the time we get started, we're all invested in this story. And the cards will give us the here is the base challenge. But even as you go, a lot of the cards will ask questions. And if you answer the question, you get a bonus. So part of that idea is it's all about trying to... You know, again, this being a game you can play with someone who's never played D&D, &D, who doesn't understand the idea, but you can say you've got to get through a gate. How are you going to do it? If you tell me, you'll get a plus one. <laughs> so how would you get through a gate? Yeah. And, and so it's that kind of idea of it's as casual as you want it to be. Even in that example, you don't have to do it. You just won't right. get a plus one if you don't tell me. Yeah. But it's a thing that tries to draw people into collaborative storytelling. Um, yeah, so yeah. It gives them permission, right? Exactly. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and because, as I said, it largely encourages you to create your own story, it is loosely set in the world of the Bureau of Balance, but it's basically saying make your own characters, make your own story. Each time we encounter the dragon, it can be a totally different dragon. Uh, and... And sort of, again, you know, build on a familiar framework. But but the important thing is we are building this story together. So as people have been playing it, Keith, uh, whether it be during playtest or not, um, what are some of the things that people have said that made you go, we, you know what? Damn it. We did it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, we're, like we, we this is what we set out to do. And now that I hear people talking about it, what are, what are they saying that makes you realize that 
you, you did what you wanted to. Well, part of it is, again, just people uh, saying like, yes, I played this with my husband who's never listened to the Adventure Zone or played a role playing game. Right. Uh, and and that he loves it. So, you know, that's sort of the main thing is it's just that. Or I've certainly heard from a number of people who have played it with their kids, you know. Yep. Uh, so parents playing with their kids and kids like telling stories just <laughs> yeah, a this just surprise. in <laughs> um and so so that was certainly a big thing and certainly for me a lot of it was just uh we play tested this a lot and i'm just saying i love seeing what people come up with you know people coming up with ideas that i would never have thought of on my own and uh and this just being a chance you know it's just creating that framework and this is the whole a whole point is this is not a replacement for something like D&D it's a different right. experience this is the thing you could do when you've only got 90 minutes you haven't made up a story but hey let's play a round of uh, of bureau of balance and it's that sort of halfway point between something like fiasco which is 100% we are just building a story together to D and D, which is we have numbers, we have stats. The monster has eighty hit points. We're gonna, you know, and this is in the middle of. Ultimately, it does come down to dice. There are dice, but when you compare it to something like, for example, because some people might say, "Well, this sounds like," uh, if you compare it to something like uh, the Pathfinder Adventure card game, it is intentionally much lighter. You know, some people have said you can almost see it as almost like a party game. And we're like, it's right. an adventuring party game. And that that's the point is to me, uh, the Pathfinder card game is very impressive, but is complex enough that at that point you might almost just play D&D. &D. Yep. And whereas with the Adventure Zone, we wanted that thing that sort of helps you just jump in and make a story. Uh, and go from there. And and I will say, whether it's playtesting or hearing people talk about it, hearing the stories that people have come up with, seeing them post their characters that they've made. That's cool. Uh, it, it just makes me very happy. I love, Keith, that it encourages something that um, I discovered coming back. And that's the idea of, of the burden is everybody's. That, that we're going to sit down and we're going to play you know, Bureau of Balance or we're going to play Pathfinder. And right. it's not it's not the GM's job to entertain us all right. and put on the show that and again, something that was not there when I left. It, it, it's at somewhere everybody kind of figured out that we're into this together and, and we're going to be collaborative. And one of the first things that exposed me to it was the concept, uh, speaking of Warhammer, is the narrative dice uh, that little came up with. And that idea that, you know, tell all right, you saw the dice. Tell me what you did. <laughs> like when I first saw Absolutely. that, I, when I saw that for the first time, which I know it's not new, but it was new to me. I was like, holy crap, that's amazing. And uh, in Bureau of Balance, that's one of the main points of right. the uh, the team leader yeah. is you're not telling the story, but occasionally make sure you ask questions Love when it. someone defeats the thing. Say, how'd you do that? You know, or, you know, again, exactly that is it's not just the die roll. It's that's the story. So tell us what happened. Right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah, it's I it's, I love it's it. neat that you have created mechanically a, a way to introduce that. Mm -hmm. Right. And c mm -hmm. because people that play other games that are non role playing games, that concept of of a shared responsibility that we're all responsible for each other's fun, mm -hmm. we're responsible for each other's enjoyment. Um, it's neat that that sounds like it's literally built into oh, yeah. your game. That's very, very and, cool. And again, you know, what I will say is, is I don't assert that that Bureau of Balance is, you know, revolutionary or game changing sure. or anything like that. But it's fun. Right. And it is exactly that of it's something that I do feel you can play with anyone, you yep. know, that that as long as they want to tell a story, even if they haven't done it, even if they're nervous, as long as they're open to the idea of we're going to have a little fantasy adventure, uh, you know, doesn't matter if they've if, you know, basically for the people who have played a lot of D&D. There's enough choice that you get mm -hmm. to make interesting decisions for the people who haven't played any at all. It has enough of a framework to push you forward without having so much as to be overwhelming. And it's it's that spot, like I said, between a full game like uh, like D&D &D or between a completely free form experience like Fiasco. 
Well, and I like the idea that you're not trying to replace anything. You're just finding this little sweet spot and yep. this is where it lives. And if you want to come here, it's here for you and you can play it. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. So, Keith, for people listening that want more Keith, want more Eberron, want more Bureau of Balance, what is the best place for them to go? Okay. So for the uh, the Adventure Zone, if you go to the AdventureZoneGame.com, that's all one word. Easiest place to find that. Uh, for me personally, it is Keith, K-E-I-T-H hyphen Baker, B-A-K-E-R, like butcher and candlestick maker. Uh, so Keith-Baker.com is my website. And uh, that's where I, a couple times a month, I write some kind of crazy article about uh, Eberron. I am currently uh, just launching uh, a, a actual play called Threshold, where I'm actually uh, drawing in players from my Patreon supporters. Every session, I'm going to play with a different group of players. And uh, so those are all places you can find me. Well, and they can find you on Patreon too, right? That's and correct. Patreon, obviously, Keith Baker. One, uh, yeah, Keith Baker. One of the benefits is obviously the an opportunity that some of them get to play yep. uh, in there. Um, what else can they get on Patreon? Well, so the thing with Patreon is, is what I'm doing now with this game I'm calling Threshold is basically uh, I'm running the game and each session, we have a shared group of characters, which actually all the patrons worked together to create. Nice. Uh, and each session, a different group of players will play the characters. So it's sort of oh, an ongoing cool. story, but different people will do it. But as I said, even if you don't end up uh, you know, playing in a game, every month we're doing polls and things that help shape the story. So like Very. I say, all the characters were created through this series of doing polls and discussions. And so so the whole idea is even though only five people at a time are actually going to get to sit in the session, what we are doing is creating a story together. And that collaborative storytelling is what I love so much. Beyond that, uh, Patreon supporters also every month I hold polls on what the topic of my next articles will be. Uh, so, and I answer other questions. So you get to sort of shape, uh, you know, shape again the content that I'm creating online. Very, very cool. And I will have links to all of that in the show notes. Keith, I'm going to have to come up with an excuse to have you back. Oh, well, um, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed your time, man. Thank you. All right. And for those that stuck around to the very end, thanks for listening. <laughs> Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch so you don't miss the avalanche of content we create. Links are in the show notes. Be sure to check out our shop on thirdfloorwars.com for the latest in gaming apparel and gear. There you'll also find the latest information for the U.S. Faux Tour. Find out where you rank in your conference or even in the entire United States. Get those models built, painted, and ready so we can see you at the next U.S. Faux Tour Masters event. Please take a moment to write a review of this pod on your favorite platform. Rating and reviewing helps us find more listeners almost as cool as you are. Be sure to share this feed with all of your friends who love tabletop gaming. Thanks for listening. Howdy folks, Craig here. Now if you love gadgets as much as we do, you're going to love the new Third Floor Wars Gadget Bundle from Schooner Labs. Branded with the logo of your favorite podcast, it comes with two measuring multi-tools, a compass stepper for those tight and important movements, along with a compact dashboard to track your turn, strat, and scheme scoring along with your soul stones and pass tokens. It is the perfect bundle for anyone who plays Malifaux or just wants to look cool while doing it. The link is in the show notes. Check them out and help support your favorite gaming podcast. All right, this is the part I'm the most excited about. Okay. Because I did a little poking around on this, and I'm dying to hear about it. So, mm -hmm. All right. Before I dive into this, though, is there anything that we have missed? Any stuff that you want to make sure I, you're all right? Okay. No, I think it's great. Okay. I don't want, to, don't want you to hang up with me and go, that son of a bitch no, Craig no. didn't talk. Okay. <laughs> all right. That's outstanding, my friend. Hmm. Um... And I think what I'm going to do is we'll kind of get into the tips and tricks for people. So the I idea being that we're going to turn some people on. This is, they're going to run Eberron for the first time after hearing this, and maybe we can give them a running start. Um, so I think sure. I'm going to move that down yep. to this section, if that's all right. Yep. All right, great. All right. 
So I was told, Keith, it's very hard to uh, get you talking, but... Uh... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a real... <laughs> Uh, you know, they, tight lipped. We'll have to we'll have to go very fast. Do you have a, a hard uh, a hard limit on your time? I right. don't. In fact, um, it was uh, two days ago I in, uh, interviewed John Harper, uh, and uh, boy, John and I got talking. And three hours later, we're still we're still talking. Oh, I, so. I gotta say, Lady Blackbird, one of my favorite, uh, um, and that's John Harper. Yeah, it right? is. That's Harper. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Lady Lady Blackbird's still one of my favorite indie systems. He, I, uh, um, He's I did a, neat a bunch guy. of stuff for that. Neat yeah. guy and very it was very interesting. Um mm-hmm. I uh the podcast started off as strictly just tabletop gaming miniatures focused on Malifo by Weird Games. Mm-hmm. And um as my interests weed and change a little bit, so does the podcast. Obviously it follows me. And uh fo- finding RPGs again, I've been now instead of having tabletop designers on the show, I've been having a lot of role playing uh, designers right, right. on the show and um I, it was just fascinating uh to talk to harper and and part of it and this is why i'm so excited to talk to you is because of my rumpelstiltskin story of you know stopping and like 92 was the last time i played role-playing games and literally mm-hmm. was paid no attention to what was happening and then woke up again you know a year ago and everything had changed <laughs> so, absolutely uh, so it's been neat for me to talk to people like you and john that um you know were making huge waves while i was sleeping uh so it's, <laughs> it's been very exciting so i appreciate you coming on oh no thanks for having me all right i've got to listen to your your uh, talk with john i i love everything it'll he be, does yeah it'll be out next month um excellent one that you might enjoy is uh the one that came out Today, this morning, was uh, Dennis Detwiller of Delta Green. Oh, nice. Funny thing there, Dennis and I worked together at a computer game company. <laughs> well, I'm amazed how many, how, what the overlap is. I've talked oh, to yeah. so many that, that dipped in and dipped out uh, of the computer gaming industry. But you worked with Dennis, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. I'm going to bring us back. And... I- and Keith, I I've never played Eberron, um, so I'm I'm a bit of a virgin um, as That's far fine. as is concerned. But I'm I think a lot of my listeners are too, so I think it'll I'll be a good conduit for you to to communicate it um, mm-hmm. uh, through. All right, I'll bring us back. Hey, are you still here? Look, uh, the podcast is over, and you sat through all of the breaks and bloopers. Well. I mean, if you're here, might as well run over to patreon.com and become a supporter. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast, too, while you're at it, on whatever platform you're listening to. I do appreciate you sticking around. Take care.